stand in front of an amazing building that has for many years represented the best in the diligent pursuit of excellence. It is a place of great mobility. Where better to start a marriage? So uh, our hope, our prayer for your marriage is that it will be like this building. Strong, beautiful, elegant, noble, and impressive. And dedicated to the diligent pursuit of what is best for both of you as followers of Jesus Christ. And as such, it's only fitting then that we look to God's word for encouragement and instruction as you begin your lives together today. Let me read just five verses, seven verses actually, from Colossians chapter 3 from the pen of the Apostle Paul. And so as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. And beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And then he ends it this way. Whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Whatever you do, well, I guess that would be there. That we are to do it in a way that's pleasing to him. In this real short text, Apostle Paul makes a connection between God's love for us and our love for each other. And over the next 45 minutes, I'd like to explain it to you. That we <laughs> Actually, I've been that shortly. Your mom wanted the whole version. And I told her, your dad said, keep it short. <laughs> so you notice that what Paul says is, as those who have been chosen of God put on a heart of compassion. He makes a connection between who we are as God's chosen family, his beloved ones, and the way we live, and more importantly, the way we love. Someone has rightly said that love completes life. And whoever said it was not only right, they were expressing great theology. It is love that completes life. Fundamentally, we come to this world incomplete. And as we grow, we realize that. In fact, we're not only incomplete, we're broken. We're in decay. And apart from the love of God, Christ, we remain that way. And yet, God in his great love came to us and with his love and his forgiveness completed us, made us what we were already always created to be. And that is someone who brought glory to him. A great thinker in the fourth century, Augustine said, you have made us for yourselves and we are restless until we find our rest. For nowhere else is there rest except in Christ. And so Paul reminds us as a first importance that those who have been chosen by God as his children are to put on love. You know, one of the wonderful things about uh, my job is that I get to study the Bible as much as I want to, right? Uh, I get paid to be good. You guys have to be good for nothing. <laughs> and what I find when I study the Bible is that throughout Christ of the church. Why? 
What is it about marriage at the very essence of it that lifts us in adoration to God? Well, it's this. The way God's love completes us spiritually is best understood by the way we find completion in marriage. Remember Adam, that guy, that first guy back in the Garden of Eden? God made everything very good, and then all of a sudden he looked at Adam and he said, it's not good for him to be alone. That wasn't because he never asked directions. Right? It was because alone he was incomplete. And so he made Eve and brought him to Adam, and Adam rejoiced. Here was the completer that God had designed for him. Michael, Gina, God has given you a great gift by creating you and designing you for one another. Now, you were both answers to prayer. Gina, you're an answer to prayer. Prayer offered up by Michael and his friends and family during a very difficult time in his life. A time he never thought that God would once again grant him the ability to love. And yet you're here. We are so pleased with how wonderfully God has answered his prayers. And Michael, as you stand here, you are as well an answer to many prayers offered up by Gina and her family and her friends and her children. And I say all this to remind you both that even as God has chosen you to love him, and in so doing has brought you to completion, he also has chosen that you would love one another. As husband and wife, we find lifelong completion, satisfaction, and ecstasy in the love that he gives you. This is the key to a lasting marriage. It's not really just about you. It's about the fact that God's in us. That's why I'm here. Could have gone to the library and gotten here, <laughs> but you know, which is kind of cutting into our business. Right? <laughs> so you know what? You decided that you would have someone who represents God say these things, and in old turn to solemnize your marriage. That's because it's always been understood that what you're entering into is a covenant that God is witness to. He created it. So take in the love of God. Revel in it, love it, and then breathe out love to one another in a way that allows you to follow what Paul says, to put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, and forgive one another. Why would he tell us to put on a heart of compassion? Now, right now, it's easy for you. Uh, you come to this place, and you can just hardly wait to be married. You can never think of a time when you might not be compassionate. There are a few married couples out in the audience who know that there will come a time when you will revel in your own selfishness, when you will not live in the realm of kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, and forgiveness. And let me warn you that about the great enemy of marital harmony. It is this, that while God has given you the opportunity to complete your mate, your heart will try to make sure that you're the one that has all the rights. Uh, you're going to end up at some point saying, yeah, the two become one and I'm the one. Okay. But Paul wrote, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind that each of you, Michael, Gina, consider one another as more important. So, nothing will cause the flower of your relationship. And by the way, these flowers are amazing. As you look at them, they're bright, they're fresh, they're vibrant. Think of your marriage as a flower. Nothing will cause your, your marriage flower to shrivel faster than the worm of selfishness. You need to take radical means to protect yourselves from it. Take care and be open to one another. Intent on serving rather than being served, on loving rather than being loved, and on giving rather than on expecting to receive. You know, in your marriage, you have a wonderful opportunity to show this world what it's supposed to be, what marriage is supposed to be. We have a lot of illustrations of what it's not supposed to be. I'm praying that yours will never be that. That they will stick out. That you will swim upstream against the tide of culture that is trying to tell us that marriage doesn't matter and that marriage isn't sacred. Swim upstream against that. And make sure that those who come into your home leave knowing that this is a place where what God says about marriage is honored because it's our best option. Michael, today you're taking to yourself a wonderful woman. I think you know that every time you look at her, you give us that great big smile. I always want to give you two words to love her. And all that that means, 
Make sure everyone, including her, knows just how wonderful she is, how captivated you are with her charms. Treat her royally. Use every and every opportunity to pamper her, to spoil her, to display your affection and care for her. What I'm saying is treat her so well that all of her friends are secretly jealous. <laughs> Mike will also take very seriously your responsibility to lead your families in the ways of the Lord. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. Read it, study it, meditate on the word. Build your home on the rock of truth. Pray earnestly and often for yourself, for your wife, and for these precious little kids. Jackie, you are so beautiful today. And Dion, I was so proud of you bringing your mom down that long, cobblestone walk away. You did well. <laughs> and Michael, guess what? God has graciously granted them the opportunity to look to you as the dad. What a joy. Build your home on God's word and ask for his protection and guidance. And Gina, today you're joining yourself to a wonderful man. I know because as I listened to his life story when I baptized him a few months ago, I got tears in my eyes. This is a man who's persevered through deep waters and come out the other side better, purer, stronger, more courageous. And so as you love him, let your life display the fact that you are his and his alone. Walk with him through his struggles, listen to his disappointments, encourage his dreams, and follow his loving leadership. Be his ally against the wars of this world and allow your heart to find a vacation spot. Pray with him, pray for him, and ask God to give you both the sense that his power and presence abide in your home. Family and friends, uh, we also have a responsibility. It is a responsibility of love, love that encourages, love that comforts, and love that prays that God's blessing will always remain in his dear ones in the marriage that we need today. Marriage is an institution of God, it's one which he loves blesses, but it's also an institution in which he makes great demands. Stay close to him and we'll stay close to each other. For all those things which God commands of us, he is faithful to enable in us. Let's pray. Lord, we do love you. And we honor your wisdom today in designing this thing called marriage through which you not only manifested the majesty of your love for us, but so generously provided for our happiness well-being. Lord, may your grace abound to Michael and Gina from this day on. May their union serve to increase their reliance on you. May their joy in one another move their hearts to worship you. May their willing and sacrificial love for one another increase their wonder at the redeeming love of Jesus Christ. Give them great patience with one another and give them soft and forgiving hearts. Keep them, Lord, near to you. And may their every day be an occasion of blessing Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, Michael and Gina, having declared to me that it is your intention to enter into marriage in keeping with God's standards, I ask you now to join right hands and repeat after me the solemn vows which you have chosen as an enduring testimony before God and these witnesses of your devotion to one another. Michael, repeat after me. 